we're going to start with our webinar for today, which is fireworks, fear, and dog. And with Diwali approaching, there are a lot of people concerned about this issue. Now it's going to be Diwali, and now there are going to be firecrackers going off, and my dog is frightened. Some people even tell me my dog has a phobia. So before I move into that, I want to talk about what, what is really a fear and what is really a phobia. Okay, so when an animal is frightened, there are two reactions it can have. The first one, which is the main one, is it gets fearful and it will act in order to save itself. So it will move away from the source of fear, move away from the source of danger. In a true phobic circumstance, the animal does not know how it is behaving. It's just in such a crazy state of panic that it just does crazy things and it actually can put itself in more fear and in more danger. So for example, say you have an you have somebody say scared of heights. Typically when a person's scared of heights, they won't go to the edge of something. They won't look down because, and, and if they happen to be there, they'll move away. Even if they instinctively freeze, they tend to be doing things that would protect themselves. But in a phobic situation, you, you just get so scared with what you're doing, you run in panic. And that running in panic could actually make you fall off that mountain. So fears and phobias are two very different things. You know, when people discuss them with me, I say, let's make it clear. Your dog could have a high level fear, but it's not at this point a phobic reaction. So our first question for this evening is, so why do dogs get scared of loud noises. You know, there are people who tell me, my last dog never got scared of noises. I don't know what happened this time. Why this dog of mine, my current dog, is scared of noises. So let's look at some of the reasons why a dog could be scared of noises. The first thing, and this is typically what happens. You know, the first time your dog hears a firecracker, he's going to be, oh, that was something loud. How many times you're walking down the street and you hear a sudden loud blast from somewhere. It could be a truck tire bursting. It could be a firecracker let off. How many of you are like me where we jump when there is a loud sound? I, I do. I hate firecrackers because if I'm walking or I'm doing something and a person goes, what? you know, anywhere in the vicinity, I'm going to be like, oh, oh God. Oh God, why, why? You know, I'm like that. So animals cannot understand it. See, I can understand it. I can say, oh, it's just another firecracker. It's not going to harm me. It's fine. But an animal says, what was that? Is that the end of the world? So they cannot understand. And you know what? We cannot explain to them saying, it's just a firecracker. It's not going to harm you. You can't do any of that. So that's what makes it worse. And to add to the whole thing is that animals are more sound sensitive than we are. They can hear better frequencies, the sounds that we hear are amplified to their ears, which means what you hear and what they hear are miles apart. And you really have to think about somebody letting off a firecracker in your ear kind of a thing to understand what they feel like. Okay? So for them, it is an explanation less sound and they don't know what to do. And most of them, especially street dogs, they don't understand that this is harmless. They think, that's going to harm them, whatever that sound is, and it's coming to get them and they panic. Which is where then the first experience starts like that or the second or third, and then it grows from there where they say, oh God, if I hear this, something bad is going to happen and I need to be frightened. And you know, fear, when we talk about fear, when we talk about traumas, phobias, all go to a certain part of your brain so when we have the whole brain, it goes to a certain part that we call as the primitive brain. And the primitive brain controls all of this, which means you don't really get to choose whether you want to be frightened or not. It comes into a survival instinct where the animal's brain says, hey, start being frightened. This is something that could harm you. Be frightened. Do things to get away from it. Because if you're not frightened, you could go towards it. You could get harmed. So your brain gets triggered. And that's not something really the animal chooses. And then this starts to become a conditioned response where the brain says, look, we heard it the first time and we needed to get scared to get away from it. Now when we hear it again or again, 
you must remain in the state of fear so that you can protect yourself. And keep in mind for animals, all of these triggers are ways for survival, right? This is how they protect themselves. So, you know, for people to say, come on, what is it? Why are you scared? What is the big deal? You've got to stop saying that to the animals. When I say animals, I mean your cats, your dogs, whatever you've got at home. You can't keep telling them to rationalize the sound because they cannot do it the way we can. For them, it is, oh my God, it's something bad. It's going to hurt me. It's going to harm me. I must be frightened and get away from it. Sometimes, especially with young dogs, if you have a young dog at home and you have an adult dog at home or a human being, which would be me, I'm a terrible, terrible example to have around young dogs or anybody actually. Because if you have a dog who's scared at Diwali time and the firecracker goes off and that dog goes, oh, and runs and hides, goes under the bed, all the puppies are going to copy that behavior. All the young dogs at home are going to say, oh my, are you scared? Well, I didn't know what to be, but I'm going to copy you because my survival tells me to do so. And if you have a young dog, do not expose that dog to me. And I'll tell you why, because I'm the worst person around firecrackers. If a firecracker goes off, I'm going to be literally like this. I go, oh, oh God, why do you have to do that? And then I mumble under my breath and I'm like irritable and I'm upset. And honestly, thank it's a credit to my dog, Maya, that ha she hasn't copied my behavior because any dog sitting would have said, oh, look, she's so worried about this sound. She hates it so much. Look how she jumped. Now, if, if my role model does that, I should too. So, you know, if somebody told me, I have a young dog, you're a behaviorist, can I send her to your house for Diwali? I'd say never, because I'm such a bad role model. So if you're like me, then be careful because of what you could be teaching your dog. Or if you have a dog at home that's scared, be careful. It takes one Diwali for a young dog to look at the other dog and say, I need to be scared of these sounds. Okay. And then there are dogs that have just had bad experiences, right? And this comes to a lot of poor street dogs. Um, firecrackers fly in that direction. I've had firecrackers where people have told, firecracker came into their balcony and the dog was lying, sleeping there and the thing fell on him and he got hurt. Now, can you imagine now, the dog's going to connect all those dots. So any bad experience, it doesn't even have to be firecracker related. Say my dog is sleeping next to me. A firecracker goes off in the distance and I drop say, a pencil box on her by mistake. And she goes, oh, what was that? She's going to connect that sound back to the firecracker, do the thing falling on her and start saying, all the dots connected, that was bad. So any bad experience that happens at that time is going to be in the dog's mind. And, you know, when a lot of people tell me, so take it out of the dog, take out the fear. What is there? What's the big deal? But fears are very, very difficult to remove from the brain. Why? Because the part of the brain that controls the fear controls the survival. So it's not going to let go of that very easily because it's going to say, we need to hold on because what if it happened next time? And what if we didn't live through it? So fear is there as a survival tool. So what do we see? How can you tell? So a lot of people say, so my dog does this, my dog does that. And is my dog scared? So what are the signs you're likely to see for fear, right? Your dog will pace about, pacing, pacing, whining, salivating, trembling. My very first dog that I grew up in a home with was a black doberman called Sambo. And Sambo hated Diwali time. He would, when the firecrackers would go off, he'd go to the passage of our home. I don't know why he went there. That was his chosen place. And he'd pace and he'd be salivating. And his legs would be trembling and he'd crouch. He'd try to sit and then he'd get up within two seconds saying, no, that's not working. You could see he was trying his own things to self-soothe. I was just a young child at that time. I must have been like six years old. And, you know, if we went to comfort him, he didn't notice we were there. That level of panic was so high. Um, I remember spending many nights sitting in that passage in my pajamas, just sitting there and watching him go through this. And if... If you, and I'm sure you do, if you love your dogs, you know how horrible it is to see them suffering like that. 
And there were times when my mom would tell me, now leave him alone. He wants to be alone. Don't be around him. He doesn't like it. So I would sit in my bed. I would not sleep. I would be crying the whole night till he fell asleep. And he, honestly, he would not stop till the fireworks stopped. So he would do all of these things. Thankfully, he didn't urinate, but that's a, like a high, high level. Sometimes dogs get so scared, they'll urinate. If they're defecating, it'll be like loose diarrhea stools, you know, like loose because of the stress involved. Some dogs are known, and Sambo did it, he'd scratch at the doors to get out. And, you know, you look at these dogs and say, hello, the noise is out. You're safe inside. But dogs cannot rationalize that. They cannot understand because they think the sounds coming from in and getting out is the way to be safe. So some dogs scratch, they claw, they chew things out of stress. Remember, this is so different from a regular chewing behavior. So a dog regularly chewing would sit and go, ow, ow, ow. This would be more like, ha, 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 biting, 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 because he's so stressed out. Some white try to hide, they try to go inside things. And you know, you look at them and say, where are you getting in behind the cupboard? There's no space for you. But they try, they'll squeeze, squeeze into things. Um, some will just try to run away and you know if you try to say here eat a treat eat a chew stick calm down they won't take anything some want to be around us some don't want to be and some actually get angry they get aggressive and they say I don't know what this is and I'm going to bite the nearest thing and if the nearest thing is you you're going to get bitten so what are the other signs we are going to see excessive panting 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 some don't so some pets don't like being touched so if you go to calm them they'll say don't touch me now. So my dog Sambo was like that. You could pat him. He didn't move away, but he just stood there. It, it was like he couldn't feel anything. Some will hide, like we said, and most withdraw. So if you're trying to play a game, they'll be like, oh, oh, God, leave me alone. I just don't want to do anything. Okay. Yawning is a sign of stress. Some get so scared, they mutilate, they bite, bite, bite. Now here's the thing with self-mutilatory behaviors. The more you do it, the body releases certain chemicals called endorphins. Endorphins kind of give you a high. And that means you're going to do more of it. It forms a cycle of addiction. And then some are so panicked, so scared, so much nervous energy comes in that they show hyperactive behavior. So if you see your dog showing any of these signs, even a couple of them, then start to say, hey, is this happening at this time? Could you be frightened? Is this how you're manifesting your fear? You know, it's up to us to start listening to what they're saying. Most people are so oblivious and they come and tell me, what is the need to do this? My dog is fine. I'm not attending the webinar. And some people are just here out of curiosity. So they say, but how many of you would look at this and say, oh my God, my dog does this till now. I never realized that he could be reacting as a fear to all of this. I thought he was fine. So my current dog, Maya, she does not get really affected that much where she's showing extreme signs of fear like pacing or trembling. But you can see the minute the first firecracker starts, she goes, she makes this face like this, like, oh, again, these human beings. And she'll go quietly into the bedroom. Then she'll go into the bathroom. And that's again where the least sound will come. And then she'll sit there making dirty faces the whole evening. So she'll be like, Oh, God, I could have sat outside all of today, but those firecrackers will be there. I don't know what this is. So she'd be like that the whole day. So while she may not manifest large outward signs of stress, you can see that it is upsetting her. And, you know, for her, a couple of things she loves is she wants to come to me and she wants to be comforted. So we comfort her the whole night. It is like, and, and the minute she says, oh, no, there's nothing for 10 minutes, she'll go out, she'll do things. She hears it, she'll come back. And if you stop patting her, she, she'll put her head under your arm and she'll push you and say, keep patting, keep patting. I need the patting. I don't feel good otherwise. Okay. So now we come to the part where we say, now what can we do? What if your dog is frightened of the noise? So here are a couple of things. There's a lot of stuff I've got prepared. And we, we divide them into targets, okay? So one is what we call as managing the environment, which is where the dog stays. So what, are, what do I mean by prepare in advance for the evening? It means get everything sorted. 
if you need to take your dog for a walk, if you need to give your dog food, if you need to prepare a room for your dog, don't wait for the firecrackers to start. So ideally, I tell people, say about 7, 7.30 when the firecrackers start, your dog at that time should safely be indoors with everything prepared. That's not the time to go for a walk because whatever no noise comes, your dog spooks, pulls on the leash, slips out of the leash. Those are nightmares. Okay? Then people call me and say, oh, he's not eating because the firecrackers are going on. So here's what I tell people. Finish all that before the firecrackers happen. Because very likely around that time, your dog's not going to be wanting to go for walks or eat or play. So all of that that would happen at that time, do it before or maybe do it after. But prepare. Don't suddenly be saying, oh my God, it's 7.30, everybody run. Don't do that. Okay? Then the second thing, and this is really the best thing you can do. Find a room of your house. If your dog hasn't found that already, so find a room where your dog is going to be comfortable. So on her own, my dog Maya says, this room and in this room, this bathroom, I'm going to sit in. So what I do is say, well, that's your choice. I'm going to leave you there. And how I help her is I close all the doors. I close all the windows. You can start what we call is a white noise. What's a white noise? It's like a background noise. So you can start a fan. You can put on some sort of machine, you know, just a like a hum in the back or a whir like an air conditioner, a fan, maybe a light TV sound, just something in the background. What happens with white noises is your brain, because it's a repetitive humming kind of sound, the brain zones in on that and it can calm you down. It kind of can take away all the other sounds that are happening. Okay, And keep in mind, a lot of dogs like small confined places. So if Maya tried to go under the bed, I would let her, if she wants to go behind the cupboard, I might move it out a bit and let her. So the smaller, tighter spaces are the ones they choose. And this is their choice. So as long as it's a safe place, okay, allow them to be there. You can give them their bedding there. You can keep a few things to comfort them. And then my suggestion is, if that's where they want to be, if they want to hide at that time, let them hide. If they want you to pat them, do the patting. So there is no fixed rule. Some dogs want to be left alone. Leave them alone. They clearly tell you, just don't, don't come near me. Okay. And the others will say, no, no, no. Can you comfort me? Can I sit on your lap? Can you pat me? Well, for those dogs, you do that. You go with what your dog wants. Okay. Just because your neighbor's dog likes to do something doesn't mean yours would. So go with the flow of your particular dog. Then we say something called measuring the levels of fear. You know your dog well, all right? And on a scale of zero to 10, measure the fear. So we say zero, very relaxed dog, sleeping dog, resting dog, fine. 10, panic, screaming, throwing about, salivating, all of that. Where would you put your dog in the middle? So if it's a five and above, then the levels of fear are pretty high. If it's five or below, then maybe you can distract. So a good thing to do, which is what I try to do with Maya because her levels are a little on the low side, is as soon as the fireworks start, I take out her favorite toy, which is like a football, and we play a game of football. So I want her mind at that time not thinking of, oh my God, should I be scared? Should I be scared? Because then the brain rolls into that zone and you don't want that. What I want her to think is, Oh, yeah, I can hear that sound in the background, but I'm so busy playing football right now. That's how I want her to be. But you can't do it if the fear is too high because your dog won't eat, your dog won't play, your dog won't do fun training. But if your dog's levels of fear are low, try to distract. And more than just using food, my suggestion is distract using games. Games, toys, those are the best bet. All right? So depending on what your particular dog wants, you go with that flow. Try to push a little. So she's frightened and say, come on, come on, get out of this. Let's come on, let's play. Here's the ball. Be a little animated myself. So, you know, put in a little extra effort. But otherwise, see what your dog wants. Some dogs will say, I'm not play. I, I, I just want to be left alone. Some dogs will be like, I am stressed, but oh, what are you doing? Are you playing? Oh, 
maybe I'll take a look at that. Okay. And some dogs will say, forget everything. Just pat me, reassure me that you're there with me. That's your dog's choice. You go with it. Okay. Another thing I have seen people do constantly is to see whether the dog is still frightened. So they're constantly testing the dog. So here's what I mean by that. So say the dog startles with a firecracker, hides in the bathroom or whatever. Then the next day, the pet parent says, was he scared? I don't know. Let's try it. So what we do is we go downstairs where people are bursting crackers and we tell the dog, come, let's see what you'll do now. That's the worst thing you can do. Okay, so never test your dog's fears. Are you scared? Are you not? You never try to reason with the dog. Say, look, this is a firecracker and put it in his face. You never tell the dog, come, let's go and watch firecrackers being burst. So once you know what it is, all of that makes it worse. So don't do that. And another thing people do is they punish. Say, bad dog, what are you being scared of? Don't be scared. Thinking that if they scold the dog, that reaction will go. No, it's not going to go. It's going to be worse. Imagine if you're scared and your mom or dad scolded you for being scared. Are you going to be less scared or more scared? Think now they're scolding me on top of what I'm already scared of. Oh my God. Your, your, your fears, your stress is just going to shoot up. Okay, so please don't do any of these. Never test the dog. Never say, let's see if you're still scared. No, you never do that because you're just going to make it worse. And like I said, with point number 11, you are your dog's role model. So ideally, don't be me, be the opposite of me, which means when a firecracker goes off, you have to go, what was that sound? Doesn't matter. I'm so relaxed. I'm so chilled out. Oh, come, let's play a game. Okay. Don't be me where I go, oh my God, oh, these people, I just have to burst crackers. Don't be me. Okay. Because your dog watches you and imitates you. If he sees you're scared, he's going to pick up on the fear. We don't want that. When your dog, and you watch your dogs closely, when they're scared, the first thing they'll do is, oh my God, hey, mom, what are you thinking? And they're going to look at you and depends on your behavior, they're going to copy that. And as we said earlier, don't try really try to do <clears throat> much at that time. Exercising, feeding, walking, no. Some Most dogs just say, this is the time we're not going to do anything else, but just have to focus on our safety. Another very important thing, if you're going to have a lot of guests at Diwali, maybe get a doggy door. If your door is open, sometimes your dog in its state of fear will shoot out. And I don't know how many countless dogs are lost and scared and run off. I mean, it is amazing how some are found, if at all. And you know, when a dog panics and runs in fear, they can run from here to the next locality. Okay, a couple of Diwalis ago, a, a kind of an indie dog came running into my ground floor place, you know, and I opened the door, came running in, sat in my bathroom and acted like it'd been like cared for before. So slowly I patted and I noticed there was a tag on the collar. Thank God for the tag. Okay, so if you, my suggestion is do not presume you're going to keep your dog safe. It doesn't hurt to get a little name tag. So what I did is, it I think it set the dog's name. And on the reverse, it had a phone number. Thank God for that phone number. I called up. And those people drove about, I would say, a good 10 minutes to come to me. See how, how far that dog ran if it's a 10-minute drive. And it's only because they had a name tag and a number that they got their dog back. Otherwise, this would have had to be treated as a lost dog case. So please. Don't presume, I've known of so many pet dogs where people say, I just opened the door to take a delivery. He got scared. He pushed past my legs, ran down. Before I could see where he was, he had gone. The one way you can get your dog back is with a name tag. Okay, or today you get these trackers or whatever. Put it on. Why take a chance? At the most, you'll never use it, which is awesome. But what if you had to use it? And if you take care of community dogs, street dogs, now is the time to put their tags on. Honestly, this little community dog would have just been a lost dog if that tag hadn't been there. So as soon as I called the number, they came to pick up the dog and they told me, we, you know, it's a, it's a good, I mean, 
a good drive to your place. So that dog ran in panic so far. Another thing what we're going to look at soon is drugs. All right, not the drug drugs, guys, but medicinal drugs, which you can give to your dog through your vet. Please do not give what you take or your neighbor takes. No, talk to your vet and give the proper medication. And there are just a handful. If I, I mean, I only know of one vet in Bombay who does behavior pharmacology, which means drugs for behavior use in dogs. So, and those are specific. It's not ge the general over-the-counter drugs you get for pets. These would be very specific to fears. So if you need the contact details, you DM me later and I will give them to you. Okay? But a proper prescribed drug can help your dog cope with the fears. There are two other things that I'd like you to give a shot to. Okay, One would be, so we, we looked at the environmental angle which is how do we control the environment? What can we do? So ideally, my suggestion would be when the firecrackers go off, put your dog in a room, draw the curtains. So remember the five senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Okay, you cover all five. How does the dog know how to be frightened? Right? We want to ask the dog that. And the dog says, it's the smell, it's the sight, it's the sound. We always say there's a primary trigger which could be the sound. And then the secondary set triggers are the other senses that get paired together. So what I want to tell the dog is, when I put you in this room, what are the five things I can calm you down with? Can I shut out the noise by closing all the windows? Can I remove the visual part by closing the curtains? Can I remove the smell by putting maybe a diffuser on? So you look at the five senses when your dog is sitting at Diwali and say, what can I do to make you understand that everything has changed in this room? And it's just five things, guys, five senses. So think about how your dog perceives firecrackers, the sight, the sound, the smell, the change in the air, all of that. You know that gunpowder smell you get, then the visual bursts of light, the loud sounds. You want to cut, cut those down. And now we look at what we call as a desensitization program. What does desensitization mean? It means taking the, the fear stimulus at a low level first and getting the dog used to it. Once the dog is used to it, increasing it more, increasing it. Very gradual increasing is where we say we desensitize the dog. Counter conditioning is once the dog is feeling a little better with that stimulus of fear, is slowly associating that with pleasant stuff like treats or toys or games. So here is a program that you can try. All right, you need to, if you're going to do it for this Diwali, start now because you just have about a week to go. Play the sound of the fireworks. You get them today online. You get, I don't think anybody has CDs today, but you can get these sounds online. Um, in my days, we had CDs. Um, so you get a CD which has all these kind of sounds, firecrackers and gunshots and all similar kind of sounds. And what we do is you start it at a volume where the dog says, oh, what is that sound? But he's not scared. He just goes, I can hear it. I can hear it. So he notices it, but he's not scared. Then you leave it at that for about half an hour. Then again in the evening, another half an hour of it. Okay? Slowly as it starts to become like a background sound, your dog says, it wasn't that bad. Then after a few days, when your dog says, it's all right, now I can sleep through it, you raise the volume again. But you know what? It's very gradual raising. Don't jump. Little, little, little at a time. You can keep going till you get to a point where the dog, it's pretty loud and the dog is now okay because you've slowly got him used to it. Once he's okay with it, you can now tell him, look, when the noise comes, let's play a game. Look, when the noise comes, you get to eat a treat. Look, when the noise comes, your meal time happens. So what happens is the dog's brain starts to see the noises, which is now hopefully neutral towards as being paired with fun stuff. So your dog within a week should also be a lot better with the fireworks. All right. If at any point you've rushed your program, your dog will be worried. Come back a few steps and stick to that again and then move forward. So you know why I put this last point? Keep in mind what your eventual aim is. 
because people sometimes forget what they were working towards and they go jumping, jumping, jumping stages. And now you've made your dog worse and you're like, get over it. Don't do that. Remember what you were trying to do and what you are yet trying to do is help your dog overcome this. Not test him, not put him through some sort of process and say, come out the other side on your own. No, you're going through it together. All right? So you can try the desensitizing and counter conditioning process. Okay? The next thing, and this is my favorite exercise. All right. Ideally, I would like you to do it for 10 days before Diwali, which I think we can manage, hopefully. Um, but this is what it is. Again, coming back to how the dogs see the world, right? The senses. So what I want to do, and do this at a time when your dog's naturally very sleepy and drowsy, take him into one of your calm rooms. So it can be a bedroom, any room where he's very relaxed. Okay. Then you look at the five senses. I first want to change maybe the sense of smell. Can I put a diffuser in the room, which is a calming smell like lavender, chamomile, any good smell? It can be a diffuser. It can be an agarbati. You can spray the room. You can dab a bit of aromatherapy oil around the place so there's an aroma. Second, I want to change the visual. So maybe I'll draw the curtain, start a small light in the corner, maybe cover my lights with blue cellophane paper. Just change the visual look of the room. Third thing, I want to change the sound. Play any sound that your dog likes. So it can be calming waterfalls, sound of water, music. Some people tell me their dog likes Tibetan chanting. Some people say, I know of a dog that likes Guns N' Roses music. Whatever works for you. Okay, so play a good music. Some people tell me, can I sing? Well, only if you sing all right and it's calming and soothing, then you sing. Otherwise, don't sing. All right. I knew a lady that would say nursery rhymes to the dog. Again, as long as your dog doesn't mind, I would mind, but dog doesn't mind, you do it. Okay. Then what we want to change is the touch. So don't use the dog's bed, but any old blanket, quilt, or any soft material you have, you put it on the ground. Okay. So now what you do is remember you've entered the room, you've changed all the senses. And you sit on the floor with your dog and you massage and you touch and you soothe your dog. It's very soothing for you. It slows your heartbeat. Your dog should relax. And as you massage, you can talk, you can touch. Relax your dog till he falls asleep. Now, if you do this every day, and I'm not saying do this at Diwali time. I want you to do this when there are no firecrackers going on. What will slowly start to happen, and this is our aim, is when your dog smells that smell, when your dog hears that sound, when your dog feels that touch, his brain is going to go into a state of saying, oh, it reminds me to be relaxed. It reminds me to calm. I'm going to fall asleep. Think about it, guys. How many of you, if you say meditate or listen to a certain music to calm yourself, if I played that sound now or that smell, how many of you say do a puja every morning or when you go to the temple, there's a certain smell. So in the Parsi fire temple, when we enter, there's a strong smell of sandalwood. And if you put that smell now, so whenever I smell it, sometimes my neighbor, she burns the sandalwood and it comes into my window and I go, oh, it reminds me of being in a fire temple and I'm relaxed and I'm calm. See, we're already conditioned to that. So what we're doing with the dog is conditioning his brain. When you hear this sound, when you smell this, when you feel this, all of that, you should be calm. Then when Diwali comes, and you can do it, we still have about a week to go. When Diwali comes at seven in the evening, put your dog in that room, start all these things, sit in the room. The people who have tried this method, they've told me, if my dog was an eight on 10 of fearful, with doing all this, he's come down to a four on 10. So it's a very powerful exercise because, and it's called classical conditioning. You're conditioning the brain to be in a state of calm, no matter what. You can use this at Diwali. You can use this for a dog who gets scared at the vet. Use this for a dog who doesn't like going for drive. You can use this then method for a lot of things that your dog is uncomfortable with. Give it a try. Okay. Now we're looking at products. 
what products work, what don't work. Today in the market, I see a lot of people going, get mud muffs, mud muffs. What are mud muffs exactly? The original mud muffs, if you see this picture here with the little beagles, are what we call as helicopter noise cancellation earmuffs. If you've ever sat in a helicopter and worn that, they cut out all the sound. So the original mud muffs are what you should aim for. They are complete noise cancellation devices. It is not a noise reduction. Hello, if the dog can hear it, it's just the same. You want the dog to be able to say, I can't hear anything. Those are the ones to use, guys. The others that you get in the market, like these scarves and all, they don't really cancel out the noise. They don't. They just cover the ears. But the dog can still hear the noises. So be careful of this. Also, if you're going to get the mud muffs, you have to teach your dog how to wear it. You can't say, this is good for you. Let's put it on. What's If you did that to my dog, Maya, she'd go Whoa, and take it off. Okay? No, you have to teach her. Wear it slowly. Give her a few treats so she sees it as positive. Short periods of time, little longer. Build to the state where the dog says, I don't mind having this on. Otherwise, most dogs will be even more stressed now saying, there's firecrackers and what's this on my ears? I don't like it. Another thing you can use these kind of sweater scarves that are in the market are to cover the eyes instead of the ears. I would use the, do you see the blue thing? I would use that for the eyes. So you get something called a calming cap. But instead of that, you can use this kind of a long scarf, sweater thing, cover the eyes. Why? For some dogs, seeing the bursts of light are what scare them. So if you cover the eyes and they can't see it, then they can't be scared. You see, we through these tools, we tackle the senses. Next, we're going to tackle the sense of smell. You get aromatherapy. So there is a product called this Ultimate Calm. And I know people who've used it. I haven't personally yet. And they swear by it because it releases all these oils, these smells into the air. And you just melt it. You put it on like a diffuser seemingly and you melt it. You give it a try. People use CBD oils. Again, here's the pros and cons. It can work if you know what you're doing. So you need a specific one made for pets, which is without the component called THC, so that your dog doesn't go into a high. Um, and you need the correct dosage. Some people have told me that they bought it from places. So you know, a vet preferably needs to help you with the dosage. So get the good product, be ready to pay for good quality, Get the dosage right and it can work. There's a bit of experimentation you might need to do to get there. So a couple of my clients bought it from a place. That person told them, give such a dose and their dog went to sleep. So again, that shouldn't be the whole thing. So find the correct dose. The one thing you can try is a product called Adaptil. Okay, Adaptil is a pheromone-based product. Pheromones are the smells an animal naturally gives off. You can't smell it, but the dog can and because it's a natural smell, you know, it's not going to harm your dog in any way. The only drawback with Adaptil is you don't get it locally in India. You have to pick it up on Amazon.com. It can be a headache to transport, um, to bring it down. So unless you know someone coming from abroad, maybe get it. Um, Adaptil is also a slightly highly priced thing. So some people don't like it. Again, with some dogs, it works brilliantly. And some dogs, people say, my, it had no effect on my dog. Okay, but you've got to give it some time to work. You can do homeopathy at this time. So bark flower remedies. Again, I know somebody who practices that. And if you need details of these people, you can connect with me. There's something called a thunder shirt. What is a thunder shirt? A thunder shirt's a product that is like a tightly fitted vest for the dog. And the basis of that is when you kind of swaddle a child or you swaddle yourself or swaddle the dog, it gives them the feeling of being safe. You know, it's like being in the womb. When you have little babies that are born, we swaddle them. Why? So that they feel that safety again. When an animal is scared, like a dog, the one thing they'll try to do is go in tight, confining spaces. Why? Because, you know, with that all covered like that, you feel safe. So the thunder shirt is supposed to be worn as a snug fit. And when the dog wears that, he's supposed to feel safe again. 
Now here's an alternative. You can use an old t-shirt of yours that is nice and snug and make your dog wear it. Remember, it's not about a loose fit. It's got to be snug. Please don't make it so tight that the dog can't breathe. A snug fit. Okay, anybody ever tried here weighted blankets, things like that? You'd know what I'm talking about. It makes you feel safe again. So for some dogs, people put on the thunder shirt and they notice the fears come down because the dog feels safe. And like we said earlier, you can medicate your dog because that could help it. Sometimes the levels of fear are so high that it's just medication that will help see you through that period. A couple of other things I would like you to try is maybe give your dog a small space to go into. Um, people always ask me about crate training. Here's the thing. The crate training can work if you've taught your dog to be created in a positive way beforehand. And the crate at that time or an enclosure that you've made for your dog should not be big. It should be tight. and So the dog just crawls in and sits like that. Why? Because that's how they feel comfortable. If your crate is very huge, he's not going to be that squeezed in thing which he wants. You notice dogs in the wild, street dogs, when they're scared, they'll go into these tight things, under cars, squeezing into things because that plays a role, right? So you can do crate training, but don't do it wrong where you say, go in the crate, you're scared, go inside and I'm shutting the door. No, so what we do is give them their bed, give them their chew stick, bone, whatever, and tell them, here, this little tight confined space, will you feel safer? I've known of dogs who felt very safe. So at Diwali time, they'd go into their own crate and sit. And the owner would just gently shut the door, not lock it. So if they wanted, they could come out. And some dogs say, don't put me in any confined space. I need to move. I need to roam. I need to pace. Again, go with what your dog wants. Coming now to when it's all over. So say firecrackers have happened. At 12 in the night, they finish. Finally, your dog got rested a bit, went to sleep. What do you do the next day? Did you do something? Yes, you should. Why? Because when we study the brain, when we study the body, we understand that that situation last night rolled up a lot of hormones, like your fear hormones, adrenaline, fight and flight, your cortisol, your stress hormones. And if you do nothing about that in some dogs, they will carry that to the next day and the next and the next. And then that can manifest over time into health or behavior issues. So again, you see what we've got here, the five senses. What should you do the next day? Well, research shows when you exercise the senses, when you stimulate the senses, stress levels drop. So one is the sense of touch. Give your dog something to tear. Tearing in itself is a very therapeutic exercise. Amazon boxes, shred up newspaper, throw it in. Throw in a handful of treats and now he has to rip, rip and rip. Again, my dog loves tearing. So next morning, I'm going to say, here, tear this Amazon box. Here, tear these pieces of paper. Oops, they were very important. Never mind. Um, but give her things to tear. Okay, so texture things she can tear. Maybe put sandpaper on your wall so she can rub against it. Maybe put cushions she has to walk over it. Make her senses work. Change the visual aspect. Put a plant pot in the room. Spray the smell of an orange. Make her listen to different music. So what happens is, and you don't have to do all five. Do one today, do another one sense tomorrow, any one thing. So tomorrow morning, I'd peel an orange and leave it in the room. What's she going to do? She's going to smell something. The next day, I'm going to give her a box to tear. The next day, I'm going to say, here, today I burned some food. I burned rice. I'm going to put that pot out and she's going to go, oh, oh, what is this smell? So it doesn't always have to be pleasant. It just has to be where the brain says, hello, here, cortisol, hold on. We are busy doing something else. And the seesaw of cortisol should start coming down. And you do eventually, right? I mean, if you look at, say, 10 days of Diwali, imagine the stress levels accumulating. It's terrible for the dog. Okay. And how would you know that your dog's carried that forward? If you see these signs in your dog, that it means likely your dog is saying, oh, last night was a bad night for me. Really bad night. Okay. Oh, and tonight was a bad night for me. And day after was a bad night. Eventually, we call it trigger stacking. That glass of stress 
filling, 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 filling. And as it fills, you're going to see all these signs, right? Grabbing at you, pulling, playing rough games, pulling your hair, pulling on the leash. If you've not, if these are always there, then it's different. But one minute, guys. If your dog has a lot of these already, it means your dog is already a trigger stack dog. Please look for what could be the other stressors contributing. What I'm saying is if you see these more so around the firecracker time, then you know whether you saw it in your dog or not, your dog's been affected. And you need to de-stress your dog. Remember, at the end of the day, we want to reduce cortisol. We want to increase happy hormones. So playing with your dogs can do that. And all the time, don't be going to your dog and say, now do this, now do that. I think that sometimes the most powerful things we do with our dogs is say, here, I'll give you the opportunity to calm yourself down. Here's a room, sit in the room, sit with your thoughts, process them. And when you come out, I know you would have done what you could do to relax yourself. We all have it in us, our dogs and us, to heal ourselves. Sometimes we don't give our dogs the opportunity. All a dog sometimes wants, like say you, if you have a late night tonight, you're going to be, tomorrow, can I just have an afternoon where I can take a nap? And as soon as you do that, your body heals itself. Okay? And be a little careful. You know, sometimes people say, I know I did that, I made a mistake. And I'm sitting there saying, really? Weren't you thinking? Why would you take your dog to where there are firecrackers being burst? Why would you take your dogs to watch the fireworks on a terrace when there is no walls to protect your dog? He could run anywhere. So sometimes just what I call is common sense, okay? Think, should I do this? What will the after effects be? Will this help my dog? And if the answer is no, then maybe hold back. Okay? And, you know, a lot of people don't have what I call is realistic goals. If your dog is at a panic level, you're never going to get him to be where he sings, la, 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 fireworks are going on. He's never going to be that. Okay? He can come to a point where he says, I won't panic, but I, I'll still be worried. I'm still worried, but that panic, I won't be. So be, be very practical in knowing. So if, if it was Sambo, my dog, I mean, we, I was young. I never knew what was going on. Nobody in those days knew. He would never have come to a state like where he'd sleep through Diwali. He would always, but we could have brought it down a couple of notches if we had been reasonable with what we could do. And again, the important thing that you've seen on multiple slides here is it's all about the senses. The senses tell the dog to be scared. The senses are what can help the dog to calm down. So be a little perceiving, like be, be perceptive about what's going on. Which of the senses is telling you to be scared? So for my dog, Maya, it's sound. She is fine with the visual. She's fine with the smells of Diwali. But the minute she hears the sound, her ears move and they tell me, and I say, ah, that's what talk, picked up for you to be scared. So be careful about that. And there's so many ways we can relax a dog, right? And I think it's our duty. If they've had a bad experience, it's our duty to say, here, what can I do to counteract that? And just these little things we can do can help your dog have a better, maybe a more relaxed and peaceful Diwali. And on that note, we're going to end